I want, I want the guys to potentially participate a little bit more if we can get the guys to do that. I know it's tough. Oh, nice. Um, so before, before we kind of hop into, you know, the title, which is navigating work and internships, transitioning from college to career, I was actually talking to, um, to Jen over there as well as to Terry about diving a little bit deeper into the importance of, of kind of finding that proper social emotional support, especially as, as we continue to get older and trying to connect with others. And so what I would like to do is before we start off in the diving into the career planning is really try to dive into some of the challenges as well as some ways to find support when dealing with just our health condition. Does that sound good? Cool? Sweet. I know it's a long day, right? 1.45. Um, but one thing I want to say is that we do all have something in common, several things in common. So one is that we're all direct, directly impacted by a rare disease and grew up in a rare disease family. Uh, second, most of the times, we tend to only uh, talk about kind of the medical care when we talk about transitions, we, especially we're talking about from pediatric to adult care. We don't really look at the holistic approach, we're looking at what it's like to transition into college or career or talking to friends, family, romantic partners about our condition, uh, how to self-advocate. And so that's the second thing. And the third, which is most important, is that we all have a voice. And I mentioned that in my first talk and I bring that up because we have a powerful story to share and that's actually part of the pitch especially when we're trying to pitch ourselves for for school or we're trying to pitch ourselves for a potential career and really sharing you know what skills you can bring by talking about the story and your experience so I want to make sure this doesn't uh, I'm just going to keep continue so what I want now is I want some of you guys to tell me what are some, and just feel free to shout it out. Uh, tell me what are some of the challenges that you have faced as a young adult when dealing with, you know, the social emotional challenges, Any, anything. So I know I named a few, so I kind of gave you guys a little bit, but any challenges that you guys face, what, what are, you, shout them out. Yes. He, yeah. So he, he said, absolutely, he said that a lot of people don't have the same view or perception as, as we do, and they don't necessarily look at the future. They don't understand kind of our day-to-day -to -day struggles or how we live life day-to-day. -day. And so looking at the, at the world kind of differently. What else? Relationships, yes. Dating, you know, relationships with friends, with family, um, you know, making sure that not just your immediate family, but extended family is okay with it and understands what you're going through. So aunts, uncles, cousins, rel any type of relatives. What else? Nothing else? Yes, back, Sam? Did I get his name right? Yeah. Yeah, Sam. Sweet. <laughs> I have trouble reaching stuff at some places. Yeah. No, that's a such good as, one. Such as at the hotel here. <laughs> such as what? The hotel here. Yeah. Like I can't reach the sink. I know, I know. Those towels are high. No, Even... I meant this actual sink. Oh, and the sink, yeah. My no. arms aren't long enough. Yeah. No, it's... definitely. <clears throat> so I, I did I did put a few up here. Again, these were just some that came off the top of my head and some that I've noticed kind of overlaps is like, you know, family planning, right? What does it mean to potentially have kids? What are your family planning options? You know, whether it's adopting or having kids naturally or perhaps there's in vitro fertilization. That's another whole discussion. But trying to also accept that new normal, not being defined by it, not being looked at by others looking like you're like, in, you know, that you're different. 
And so, like, one of, some, one of the uh, struggles I've had or challenges that I face is, what, like, when do you tell someone about your, your journey? Do you tell them, you know, if you're interviewing, you say, oh, by the way, uh, this is what I'm dealing with. If you're dating, you say, hi, I'm Seth, and I just want to let you know I have this condition, and do you still want to get drinks later? It really, it's a, it's a tough one though, right? Like we don't know when to tell them and personally, I do try to tell them earlier on because one, the other thing is once your story's out there, it's kind of out there, right? And, and for me, if you Google my name, you're gonna find it. So I've had people Google it and they say, oh yeah, I've learned about it and learned about Huntington's disease. And I said, well, great, what, what else would you like to know? And so that's something to kind of consider when, when you do tell your story is what do you wanna share? And it's in your, you know, your hands to figure out, do I share everything at once or do I kind of slowly bring them into my community? So now, now the other part, which is, you know, again, I don't want it to be like all, all sappy, but po the positive part I say is, what is some type of, like who's your support or what's, what are some ways to find support when dealing with this? Any thoughts? So when you're a young adult and you're looking for support, who, do, who can you turn to or what type of support can you get? Um, for me, one thing that, because I'm very goal and career oriented, so for me looking for support, I kind of looked at people that were maybe further along in their careers or in their um, professions and sought out mentors, which helped me in that aspect, but also reaching out to family and friends that, um, or just people with similar conditions as me, to ask, you know, ask for guidance and support. So they're like two separate things, but. Oh, but those are good. I think it's good to have a mix of both because I think someone's advocating for you in the workplace at the same time someone's advocating for you in your personal life as well. Yes, so uh, you know, finding those mentors, it's huge. I think it's important for all of us to say, who can be my mentor? And it's not, you don't have to necessarily, you know, email or text someone and say, hey, you know, can you be my mentor? You can just kind of let it happen naturally. Ask them for advice. Hey, I'm look, I noticed you're doing this in your career. What can you advise me? I'm looking to learn more. Or, you know, like you said, friends and family, like connecting with them. That's good. Is there any other type of support? Not, it may not be people, but it could be just anything. Your faith. I like it. Yeah, faith, faith is, a, is a really good one. You know, it, it can be supportive, especially when dealing with hardship. And that's something you can always hold on to. And that's, a, that's definitely a good way. And, you know, here's a few more that I kind of put out is like therapy. So, I, again, that could be an option for you is finding the right therapist as well who understands you. For me, it took a long time to figure that out. And I originally went to therapy when I was younger and People just wanted to learn more about my mom and, and whatnot, but didn't understand my struggles. And then eventually I found the right fit. I found the right person that I could connect with. But I also mentioned a few things like storytelling. That's, that's a way to maybe cope. Maybe it's in-person meetups, virtual meetups. You know, maybe it's a Facebook group that you find, or maybe it's, you know, conference right here. This is support, right? This is a meetup in a, in a way. I, I call it a meetup instead of a support group. I think it sounds too formal, but that's just me. And then maybe it's fundraising and advocacy. Maybe that's a way to find your support or find your way to, again, cope or make a difference. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, absolutely, and I, I think that's important, again, is making a list of, of what, are some, what are some ways to find your support. That's, a, that's something that I will uh, challenge you all to do for the New Year's resolution, perhaps, is make that list that, of your support of something that's going to help you as you move along your journey, because here's, here's one thing is that I always struggled finding what my support was both personally and professionally, and I used to just go to my friends, and that was fine, but one, my friends are not professionals. Two, they probably don't want me to bug them every time to say, hey, can you talk for 10 minutes, 20 minutes? I, I also like to 
I tend to talk a lot too, so they're like, okay, Seth, yeah, we, we're busy. But I also try to like circle, find like, okay, this friend for this, this friend for that. But you know, what I've learned is like finding the, pro the proper professional support. And in my case, again, was, okay, I'm gonna find a therapist that works for me based off of what my needs are and what I need to get to where I need to be. And I'm not saying therapy is and and all mean all. I'm not saying you need to go to it, but it's finding out what's going to help you, whether it's personal or professional, when you're trying to figure out your your support system, family, friends, music, faith, you know, going to a, a community online or in person, doing going to a fundraiser, sharing your story, doing a blog. There's a ton of things that you can do. Cool, so far. Yeah, I feel like I'm just cruising through. Any questions? Question in the back, yeah? So how do you find the, that particular type of support for the individual that somehow falls in the middle? It's sort of like when kids are young, there's daycare and those type things. When you get older, you have senior citizens. Uh -huh. But there doesn't seem to be oh. some place in the middle. I got excited. You know, because it's like um, if you don't work, let's say for whatever reason you don't work, uh -huh. no one wants to be in the house all day. At least my son doesn't. Yeah. But there are no, like, activity groups that seem to fit that age group between, let's say, 25 and 35, because most people are either working and at least where I live in, everything that I've looked into is geared at more developmentally disabled. Okay. And they do not intermingle. They have like daycare facilities where those developmentally disabled can have activities just mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a good question. I think it's really trying to, and you bring up a good point, is trying to meet them where they are, right? And like trying to figure out, well, what type of support are they, are they looking for? Are they looking to meet other people? And if that's the case, I think it was mentioned earlier about uh, this like website, which I've been to, is called Meetup, and, and searching it based off of what you're looking for. So if you really like video games, looking to join a video game club, if you really like sports, you know, finding a specific sport, if you like writing or a book club, it's really trying to figure out um, what you could potentially join. But then there's also, again, there's a ton of these, you know, online communities and trying to find people that you can connect with online as well. Um, when it comes to in-person though, I think it's, again, it's, it's tough because I think it's case by case where for me, I'm going to say, well, I want to find people who enjoy sports or maybe like the same books as me, but for someone else, it could be like, hey, I want to find someone, a music club, or I want to find, you know, people that can play board games with, or just someone to connect with and talk with. And that's, you know, another thing that really want to try to help change is how can we connect young adults to one another so that they can have these conversations, both in person as well as virtually. So virtually it could be through video conferencing where you can connect them more year round versus you know, having a chance to talk to people, say here, and then you have to wait until you know, next year to meet them again in person. So I hope that was somewhat helpful, but you and I can kind of connect more afterwards as well. Um, and so pitching your story, and I mentioned that everyone has a story here, right? Everyone has a opportunity to share it, whether you feel comfortable sharing it in person or you feel comfortable you know, texting it or, you know, recording yourself, you know, whatever that may entail. I, I, I am a big believer that each of you can tell me your story and I'll come back and say, wow, that's awesome. So now I need a volunteer. I'm going to pick on one of the guys. Which, which one of you guys want to come up here and help volunteer? All right. So what we're going to do... Everyone can hear me, right? Cool. So what we're going to do is we're going to pretend like you and I are meeting for the first time. All right? And I want you to pitch yourself to me. All right. I don't know. Can I give this to you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> in, yeah, in real life, you may not have a mic. But you can. Testing, testing. Perfect. One, two, three. All right. 
Hi, I'm Noah. Noah, you're going to shake my hand? Yeah. All right, good. <laughs> uh, Tell me about yourself, Noah. Well, um, I was originally born in uh, Humboldt, Tennessee, and um, we found out about the clinical trial here in Durham, North Carolina. Clinical trial for what? Uh, it's a clinical trial for um, mucopolysaccharidosis, or MPS. Okay. And um, MPS uh, involves um, the liver, and so my liver doesn't make one enzyme out of 75 that yours might make. And so because it doesn't make one of the 75, um, a lot of uh, my organs and different functions in my body are compromised. And um, it affects my nervous system as well as my hearing and a few other things. Thanks, Noah. Yeah. I appreciate it. Can everyone give Noah a quick, quick round of applause? All right. So, again, I think it's awesome that Noah came up, felt comfortable, felt confident, right? The handshake, nice and firm. It was good. And I think that's the biggest thing that, that Noah was telling me about. He's, you know, he said, started talking about his liver. I, I was like, what's going on here? And then he told me, explain about MPS, explain what it was. I said, okay, I get it now, right? Now, this is what, if it was me, very similar, right? I would say, hi, I'm Seth. Nice to meet you. I'm a patient advocate who comes from a family impacted by Huntington's disease. Huntington's disease is a rare neurological genetic disease, slowly deteriorating a person's physical and cog cognitive abilities. There's unfortunately no cure. It's like having ALS. Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, all in the one condition. No, I would love to find some time so that we can grab some coffee. I can learn more about you. You can learn more about me and maybe get some advice as I try to navigate my career. How does that sound? Cool. Perfect. All right. So what did, so, and this isn't an, uh, a knack on you, Noah, but what was, what was the, uh, one of the differences between what I said and what Noah said? You, you opened up the door for another opportunity to get together and, you know, kind of learn even more about each other. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. You created like a, you know, like an entryway or whatever. Yeah. That. So that's exactly it, right? It's trying to figure out what that next step is. What is that action step? So, you know, when we're having that conversation, you're, you're trying to figure out, okay, well, what can I leave them with and what do I want out of it? Do I want them, you know, if you're, if you're at a fundraiser, do I want them to donate do I want them to learn more about the condition? Do I want to meet up with them again? So those are a few things that you can think about, right? Is what do I want to leave that person with? Because this could be my only shot, and, or it could be I meet them again, and that's great. But it's understanding what, what is that goal of the conversation. There may not be, an, you don't need a big goal, right? It could just be, I just want to meet someone else. But it could be something bigger. Quick question right here in the behind you, yeah? I like both presentations personally, and I guess it, it depends on where you are. Like if you're in a situation like here, then yes. But um, out in the world, I guess if you wanna say, I don't, this is my personal opinion, uh, my MPS doesn't define me. So if somebody comes and introduces them or I introduce my say, I'll just say my name is Fanny Zambrano. You know, that's me. MPS, Morgulvor, is not me. It's part of me, but it's not me. So I introduce myself, and if somebody, what, you know, what's your story, what's your habit? Hey, I like music, I like working, I like doing this. That's who I am. I like that, and you're absolutely right. Is It depends on the situation, right? So in this case, you know, we're at this conference, so it makes sense maybe to say, here's a little bit more, but if you're out, out there talking to a stranger, you don't have to right away be like, hey, by the way, Here's, here's X, Y, and Z. But when you are at, a, at one of these conferences and you talk to people, do they ever ask you a, one of the questions saying what type of MPS you have? Is that, is that a common question? Yeah, the first thing. It's like the first thing, right? Yeah, yeah so in, in, in Huntington's disease, right, I, I mentioned it's genetic. That's like one of the first things is have you tested? Do you have it? And sometimes you're just like, dude, just let's just talk and learn about each other. Let's just connect. Like, yes, I may have this type, 
or I may have this condition, but again, like you said, don't, don't be defined. Do you have a, okay. Um, so yeah, no, that's, that's definitely a good point. So I appreciate you bringing that up about really trying to pitch yourself based off of the situation. So again, if you're going for a job interview, you don't need to necessarily bring it up. You bring up the skill sets, you bring up your experience. You really try to understand what the process is like. Now, could anyone, I know there's multiple types of MPS, but does, does anyone want to give it a shot? And I apologize, it's tough to see to tell me, pretend like I don't know what the MPS society is and can pitch me to what it is and feel, and feel confident. And you, Jenny cannot do it either. So, <laughs> so a, anyone? No one knows what the MPS society does and you're here? No, that's fine. I'm just curious if, any, if anyone wants to volunteer. Right here. Yes. Do you have a, oh. Oh, here's <laughs> All right, pretend like I, pretend like, here, I'll come out here. Pretend I like this is the first time okay. I'm here at this conference. I'm saying, what the heck is MPS Society? Um, MPS Society is a group of people that raises money and awareness of a rare genetic disorder. And what, what got you involved? Uh, I have it. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. Straight into the point. I like it there. Thank you very much. Anyone else want to give it a shot? And that was good, Sarah. So the MPS Society is a nonprofit organization that um, does research, advocacy, support for patients and families with various MPS and uh, ML-related disorders. Um, it's a place for um, patients that uh, come together and families to get support. Yeah. Nice. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, what's, what's the weather like today? Um, it's cold in this room. Thank you, Kyle. So we had two brave volunteers, I appreciate both of them, and two, two different ways of explaining it, but ultimately, you know, you get the point of, okay, here's, the, here's I'm getting to the point, whereas this is what we do, this is how we do it, and this is maybe why, why I'm involved. So Sarah's like, I'm involved because I'm, I'm living it every day. You know, you were to the point. Kyle was explaining a little bit more about the nonprofit side of it, which was good as well. So it's both different different ways to go about it. Now we're going to jump into the the fun stuff, the career, something like that. It's about really finding your purpose. So one of the biggest questions I always think about, I always think to myself, and I'm curious if you all kind of think about it too. Is you know when trying to pursue a potential job or even going to college, do you ever ask yourself like, am I happy? Do I find this, do I think this is gonna be meaningful? Do I think this is gonna be something that I'm gonna enjoy? Do any of you guys feel that way? Sometimes, maybe? What? I think that's normal for everybody to feel. Um, I think that's actually a normal thing because it's like no matter what type of human you are, you're always thinking, am I happy? Is this helping? Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. No, I... We, I, all, I, we all feel that. Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree that I think what's a little different in, in our case is trying to say, okay, is, how much is this, if it were going to college, right, how much is this going to cost me? Is this going to be too big of a burden? 
is this going to be too much for me? If it's a career thing, is it I need to make enough money to pay for my medication or to pay for my bills versus it's not about the money, it's about finding something that makes me happy or is it a mix? So that, I think that, but I do agree, this is always a question that we all have to think about. Sometimes though, I hear it time and time again where someone just says, well, I'm making good money, but I hate going into work every day and it stinks. And so how do we figure out, well, what is that purpose or what is something that makes you happy and fulfilled in life? So, I mean, for me, one of the things is, is that I was actually, I started with working in youth development, really focusing on high school under-resourced students. And I wanted to go to grad school, so I decided to do that. I moved to Chicago from the Boston, so I went from cold to colder. And I wanted to learn more about the ins and outs of nonprofits. Well, my second year in grad school, I was kind of in a funk. I was struggling to really figure out, is this the right fit for me? Because I love working with people, but I just felt like I wasn't finding the right fulfillment in life. I was feeling really down, like very depressed. And one day I was just speaking with a good friend of mine, and that's when he said, well, Seth, what is your purpose? What do you enjoy? Write it down, what makes you happy, a full list. And then from there, try to dig deeper into what, you, what you're good at or what you enjoy doing. And I was like, okay, well, I still like helping people, but to what extent do I like helping people? And eventually I switched and shifted my gear, or my career and my gears, uh, over, over to focusing on work, like I said earlier, our odyssey, supporting young adults, as well as professionally working, doing patient engagement work uh, for a company where I can give back to the health community. And that's the way that I feel like I'm able to find what makes me happy and fulfilled versus maybe for you all, you're, you're gonna say, okay, well, you know, I don't like working with kids or I love numbers or, you know, I don't like really writing or reading, even though we all have to do it, but it's trying to find that career path of yours, whether it's doing more PR stuff, uh, maybe it's doing accounting, maybe it's just being an awesome person like you all are already. So it's really trying to figure that out, but how do you get there, right? How do you figure out, do I have the skill sets to be a nurse? Do I have the skill sets to be a professional speaker or do I have the skill sets to be an accountant? And I think the way to go about that is really trying to say, well, what type of skills do I currently have? So maybe it's writing down those skills, right? And then it's trying to figure out which ones do I need for this job? And what may help is to use our friend Google, right? Google has a lot of the answers, which is a good thing, but also a scary thing. And so perhaps you're like, hey, I'm looking for nurse skills. And I Google it, it's tough to read, but I'll, I'll, I'll read it out loud. <laughs> you know, the, the, when you Google it, it shows up, it says top seven list of nursing skills. So critical thinking, attention to detail, professionalism, communication, time management. But what happens if you're like, well, I, I don't know if I'm that specific and I don't know the exact title of like, what the occupation is, but I wanna type in working with kids skills. Again, different result. So obviously one of the biggest ones is patience. As we all know, patience is key when it comes to kids. But it's also key, you know, it's also enthusiasm, communication, the, abil the ability to, I guess, hide frustration. That's an interesting one. Uh, keeping calm in an emergency. That's another interesting one. But I think you guys kind of get my point of using Google to try to figure out what skills you may have or what you're looking for when trying to develop that career path. And maybe that's the first step where you have to go to, or maybe you're already at that next level, which is, brings, brings me to uh, good old resumes. Right, raise your hand right now if you do have a resume. It's okay if you don't, it's totally fine. A cover letter, yeah, that's good. Raise your hand if, uh, 
you dread resumes just like I do. Everyone, you, uh, a few hands, that's it? You guys love resumes? I'm gonna have to sign you guys up. Resumes, so I get anxiety just thinking about it. Wait, what are, are you saying residents or res resumes? Resumes. Okay, that's what oh, I thought you said. Oh, sorry. Resumes, raise your hand if you love resumes. You love resumes? CVs, yes, yeah, CVs, it's very similar. Um, so regarding to find that purpose, right, is you need to have a resume or a CV, which is a longer version of a resume. You might have to have a cover letter. And you really have to start somewhere in life though, right? You can't just say, okay, here's my dream job and I'm gonna get there within a year. You might be able to, but it's tough, let's just say that. And so, that's not me, but I needed an example of a, of a cashier. So my first job was actually working at a grocery store as a cashier. Fun fact, there is multiple ways to bag groceries. Did you know that? I've done it all. Plastic, paper, paper and plastic, double plastic in the paper with the plastic. It's impressive, right? People do have a preference. Crazy. But now that there are some states that are trying to get rid of the plastics and everything, it might be a little different. But yeah, that, that was probably the, one of the most stressful things was like trying to figure out paper or plastic or the double paper bag plus the plastic. Anyways, I, I say all that because to get to where you need to get to where you want to be, it's really trying to, again, not just write out what skills you are looking for, but if you're going to school, right, what classes can you take? There's also opportunities online to potentially take free classes or learning about free webinars that are geared towards what you're looking to learn more about. Earlier it was mentioned about a mentor. So finding a mentor that you can talk to and learn about their, their path and how they got to where they are. Ask them, well, what skills do you need? What skills do I need? Do I need this versus, you know, versus this over here. And then, it's not even that, but it's also volunteering. I think that's one of the biggest things. Volunteering, being a, even an internship, is, is big, it's important, because you, get, you gain that experience. And I'm not saying you need to volunteer with where you wanna be, but you can definitely volunteer even with the MPS Society. I mean, there's opportunities there where the skills from one organization can transfer over to another, whether it's public speaking, fundraising. When you think of, go of volunteering at an event, what are some skills that you, might need, that you might be able to gain volunteering at a fundraising event? Yeah. Be organized. Being organized, yes. Energetic. 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 Engaging. Organized. Teamwork. Teamwork. Delegating, that's a, that's a good one, that's a good one. Ability to network, customer service, right? Building relationships. Caitlin, you taking notes over there? <laughs> Just kidding. But Caitlin would, is definitely a good person to talk to if you are looking for, for more tips on that. But yeah, you're right, right? Like you're gaining these skills that you can now use wherever you end up going. Even if, you're, if you want to become a teacher or you want to become, I know I keep bringing it up, but like an accountant, and I'm not an accountant, so. Um, but if, those are kind of the two things that come to mind. If you want to work in marketing, right? If you want to work in communications, you still need to build relationships up if you want to work in sales. So a lot of, you can see is, it's not just learning about the skills, but how you can show you know, the company how they're transferable. So if I'm trying to go from volunteering at the MPS Society and showing that I learned about building relationships to then getting a job at doing sales, I say, well, I've, I was able to build all these relationships up, which helped lead to money. And the salespeople say, oh, money, okay, let's talk, right? And so that's, a, that's one way to show that there's a transferable skill that you have. And so don't think that you need to go jump straight to that sales job. You can say, okay, well, what can I do to build these skills up? Does that make sense? Yeah? I'm trying not to bore you guys, I promise. All right? 
Oh, thank you. So one of the things also that I will say or ask is, is it okay to have more than one type of resume? Yes. yes. Why? Depends on the job, right? Depends on what you're looking for. If I'm applying for a sales job and a marketing job, I'm not going to give them the same resume, right? So I know that someone mentioned a CV earlier, and CV is great, and what I, I also call it my ultimate resume, where I just put everything down, right? Experience, skills, education, you know, volunteer experience, leadership opportunities. So that way you, you have this one big list that you can kind of go back and forth to so that when you need to pull, you don't have to say, oh crap, what did I do? What did I do again over there? Oh, it's on my ultimate resume or it's on my CV. But even with a CV, right, you have to adjust it based off of who you're giving it to. Because if you have the same CV, they may say, well, uh, what's this? Why are you talking to me about your volunteer work? It comes down to the search committee, I like it, yeah. So, you know, what I'll say is regarding resumes, I struggle with them, I'm gonna be perfectly honest. I despise them, it scares me. But I luckily have some good friends that I tend to reach out to and ask them for feedback and I think that's something that's important is don't be afraid to ask people for help. You know, if whether it's saying, hey, do you, can I see your resume so that, not to copy everything that they have, but saying, okay, what was your format? What's your style? What do you suggest having on it? Because everyone has a different way of setting up a resume and I'll tell you, when I was in grad school, I probably had a couple people look at it and each person had a different format and that was a little bit stressful, but then I figured out what, what helps me, what's appealing to me that's gonna, that, I'm e that I can go in and edit as needed. So that's something to kind of consider when you're trying to figure out, well, what do I do for resumes? What do, how do I figure it out? Who can I talk to? Do I talk to a friend who's good at resumes? So I'll reach out to those, those three right there. I'm putting you guys on the spot, my resume gurus over here, and saying, hey guys, can you look at my resume, give me some feedback? They say, sure. So everyone, make sure you talk to them after, get their email. <laughs> like, oh, you beat me to my next thing, my, my favorite part, networking. Does anyone notice that person in the far end? That's yeah, Terry. That's honestly how I met Terry, was, was through networking, which, I love, I think networking is really cool. I could be nerdy for saying that. I like to, and you don't have to be the most social person to network. You can network via email. You can network via LinkedIn. Raise your hand if you have a LinkedIn. Okay, okay. So regarding, yes, regarding LinkedIn, I think it's important because you have, it's kind of like, in a way, it's a resume, right? It has your skills, your experience, your summary. But another way to use LinkedIn is looking at who you're connected with. And then if you're looking at a job or a company, seeing if you know anyone either there or know someone who knows someone, ask for an introduction. Hey, can you connect me to this person? Leave them a little note on the LinkedIn saying, hey, would love to connect and let's chat. Whether it's, you know, if someone reaches out to me and they say, hey, let's connect, I say, yeah, what do you want to chat about, right? And it's, try it's going back to that pitch, being direct and getting that follow-up saying, okay, let's set up a time to chat for 30 minutes or let's meet in person for coffee and let's, let's learn more about one another's goals and figure out how we can help each other or how I can help you. And to go back to the story of what, how I met Terry, is that, again, I was asked to come to this event called PPALS for Patient Advocates, and Terry was there, and I started talking to Terry, and I started bugging Terry until she finally responded to me, <laughs> kind of. No, Terry's great, but honestly, I wouldn't be here today if I didn't meet Terry, right? I wouldn't be standing here today. And what I did was, Terry and I kept talking. We kept in touch. I built that relationship up with her. And eventually I said, how can we work together? Here's a new organization. She said, do you want to come speak? I said, sure, I'll do it. It's in Orlando, Disney World, absolutely. It's cold in Boston, it's like 14 degrees, absolutely. But, oh, it's, yeah. 
But it's not about even attending events and conferences. It's really just meeting them through networks. LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. I mean, there's so many different platforms now out there where you can meet with people. WhatsApp is another one. Is that what you were saying? Yeah, WhatsApp. And so I, I say all that because I'm not saying you have to go out and find all these events and conferences to attend. But I think it's important to connect with others, other like-minded individuals. So for me, I love going to health conferences because that's where my career is, that's where I work. If you're in marketing, then you maybe, maybe wanna to go to a marketing conference or go to one of that meetup website and search marketing and try to connect with other like-minded individuals. If you're in sales, same thing. There's so many different events and conferences out there or different groups, right? There's different Facebook groups, there's different you know, stories to follow. I'm a big Twitter or tweeter Tweeter? Twitter? Tweeter on Twitter? Is that it, Noah? Okay. And so, you know, that's another thing where I connect with people. I say, hey, let's connect. And you never know who, who will know someone else that's going to lead you to your next job. For me, at my job, I was connected with someone earlier in the year via LinkedIn. We chatted. He said, hey, there's a job opening. You should apply. And that's how it worked out. Same with Terry. You know, Terry was like, hey, we're looking to do more work with young adults. And I said, okay, how can I help? And that's kind of how it works. So, you know, what I say is reach out to them. It doesn't hurt to reach out. Ask them, you know, give them that goal, that action step. Ask them how, if you can take 20, 30 minutes to, for a cup of coffee or a phone call. Because, again, you never know where, you, where it may lead you. Any questions? Come on, guys. It's 227. I got three minutes. No questions? Are you guys? Yes. Woo! You know, do, do you have any, like, specific way you like to, like, track value you've created at previous positions or... You know, how do you sell the work that you've done in the past? You know, kind of build it up into a, I, I what, Got the answer? You, yeah, what do you prefer? So it depends, right? For, for LinkedIn, I think LinkedIn or resume, or, or building your resumes, it's understanding your accomplishments. So I'm, I'm really big about, like, numbers. So showing the numbers of what I was able to accomplish, but also explaining what the organization did. So to really track that is write down what you've accomplished at that organization or that volunteer opportunity. It doesn't have to be numbers either. You can say, well, you know, that you started a volunteer part of the organization or that you started a fundraising committee and that you lead the, the fundraising com committee. It really depends on what you're looking, where you're looking for, but my recommendations is really try to figure out, well, what did I accomplish last six months or last year at this place? And what can I put on my resume that's really gonna stand out? But the other part is, of it is, again, don't be afraid to ask. Ask your peers to review it, ask for feedback. I'm a big believer in feedback. Don't take it personal, just say, okay, like, thanks for the feedback. Thanks for giving me advice on what I should put or what I may need to change, or maybe it's the, the fonts are different sizes, little things like that, but I think just continue to talk to people, continue to learn, and then be honest and transparent with them about that you're, if you are looking for a job, you don't need to make it public and you know tweet about it and say, looking for a job, I hope my company doesn't see this, hashtag new job please. I don't know if that would be so smart, but what you can do is when you're talking with some people that you've built relationships with is saying, hey listen, I am, you know, always exploring new options and perhaps you, we could talk and I could pick your brain about this is what I'm trying to do. Just like that. And then again, maybe they can help you, you keep in touch with them, maybe they refer you to the next person. It's not about asking them, say, hey, give me a job, it's, hey, can you give me some advice? Does that sound good? Cool. Was that the, was that the beep? Oh. <laughs> I thought it was. I was like, okay, that right on time. Well, I appreciate it um, again, and feel free to, 
here I'll really go back real quick. If you want to connect on LinkedIn, happy to do so. If there's anything I can do to help, even if it's, hey, can you connect me with someone else or you want to touch base, happy to help. But um, I appreciate it and enjoy Disney. Uh, that's it. I got it. We're good. We're good.